So I want to discuss with you the fundamental of dendritic cable theory, but before that, I want to highlight early theoretical ideas about ne the neuron as a computational device. And so the most influential, I think, and so the most influential paper in this field, the early paper in this field, trying to connect a neuron to computation, a neuron as a microchip that computes, is a very influential work by McCulloch and Pitts, M and P, McCulloch and Pitts, what we call today the McCulloch and Pitts neuron. It appeared in a very, as I said, influential paper with a very f beautiful name, a logical calculus of the ideas immanent in the nervous activity. This is from 1948. And the ideas of this particular paper, uh, sorry, sorry, 1943, and the particular idea of this paper, which was very, very, by the way, influential for development of computer science, less influential in, of neuroscience up until recently, this particular paper was really inspired by two properties of the neuron, which you already know. One of them is this all or none nature of a neuron, the fact that neuron either fires a spike or not. So this is one aspect that influenced the work. And the other aspect that influenced the McCulloch and Pitts study or ideas are the fact that neurons receive two types of synapses. The excitatory synapse, E, and the inhibitory synapse, I. You already know this, so you basically have all the ingredients, you, you have the ingredients uh, that inspired the heavy mathematical paper of McCulloch and Pitts, but let me give you a very brief summary of what they say. So McCulloch and Pete said the following. Let's look at a neuron, a point neuron. There is no structure, no dendrites, no axon, just a point neuron. And this point neuron has an all or none property. Either it fires or not fire. And let's say that this neuron receives synapses. Excitatory synapse number one, excitatory synapse number two, excitatory synapse number three, and inhibitory synapse. And let's assume also it's an assumption, we can change this assumption, but let's assume that it is sufficient that one excitatory synapse, either that or that or the other one, is active to fire a spike, one synapse. We know that this is not the case, typically, but let's say that one synapse depolarizes the membrane to reach threshold for firing of this cell, and the inhibitory synapse tends to veto the activity of the cell. So the inhibition vetoes cell firing, and excitation attempts to fire the cell. So this is all the assumptions needed. Okay, so this is the assumption. Assuming that a single excitatory cell E can reach spike threshold, and that a single inhibitory synapse I can veto all the synaptic activity and no spike. Then McCulloch and Pete realized that you can now write a logical sentence as follows. You can say that the cell will generate an output. Let's call the output one, state one. The output one is generated if E1 or E2 or E3 are active and not I and, and not inhibition. So either one excitatory or the other excitatory or the third excitatory synapse are acti is active, but not the inhibitory synapse. So here is a logical statement. So they wanted to look at a neuron, a neuron as a logical device with threshold. Yes, an output is generated only if this logical paragraph, this logical statement, is implemented. So now you see the big jump between, between looking at that neuron is producing spikes and having synapses, excited or inhibitory, to your neuron as a logical device. And they indeed, in this very elaborate mathematical paper, 
they show that you can, using this simple McCulloch and Pitts neuron, with this simple, very simple inputs, excitatory, inhibitory, and all or none properties, you can really build a computer, a computing machine, a universal computing machine that can basically compute very complicated, sophisticated computations using networks, connected networks of such McCulloch and Pitts neurons. And this, of course, had a very, very strong influence on the generation of the modern digital computer, which also has some aspects of zero one and, and summation of inputs coming from other zero one gates and so on. So this is just to show you that you can think of a neuron as a computational element. And this, I think, is one of the first direct ideas that were implemented in a paper showing that you can be inspired by the neuron to build a computing machine. By the way, it's interesting, I don't know if many of you know, that a lot of the computer direction, computer, uh, 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 the mathematics of computers were influenced by, by neurons. So the modern computing machines, the digital machines, were very much influenced by this paper. And so the brain helped already then to inspire another machine, the, compu the dig digital computer. Of course, today the computers help us a lot to understand the brain. So there is this kind of interesting crosstalk between ideas inspired by a machine that we already have, our brain, our neurons, our spikes, to build another machine, the digital computer. We shall discuss later on this cross-fertilization when we'll talk in the next lesson about the Blue Brain Project, where you, you heavily use the digital computer to understand the brain. But this is, I think, basically the first example of looking at neurons as computing device. But of course, we know that neurons are not point neurons. We know that this is a distributed system. It has dendrites. It has axon. It has a cell body. So the question is, of course, what does a distributed system, a distributed electrical system, not a point system, not an isopotential system, by a distributed electrical system, can compute? Does it add, in principle, the fact that you have a distributed system like dendrites and axons, does it add to, at least in theory, does it add to the computational cap capability of the nervous system or of a single neuron? So this is the question. What is the computational implications of having dendritic neurons, of having a distributed system? So before I go into the development of ideas based on mathematics of dendrites, I want to repeat something that I already mentioned in the first lesson. I want to repeat the importance of mathematics in understanding complicated systems. So again, I want to discuss why model mathematically, why use mathematics as a tool to model complicated systems like the brain. So this is again Lord Kelvin. And Lord Kelvin said something again, very important. He said, I am never content until I have constructed a mathematical model of what I am studying. If I succeed in making one, I understand. Otherwise, I do not. So the basic claim here is really that if you want to describe a, a, a physical system like the brain or any other complicated phys physical system, words and graphs and data collection is not enough. Basically, you have to approach it with a very rigorous, very systematic, mathematical approach in order to compactly describe the system. I already showed you the Hodgkin-Huxley model. I hope you are convinced that this Hodgkin-Huxley model really made a jump, conceptual jump, in understanding the spike. The spike was always there. People recorded the spike, including Hodgkin and Huxley, but eventually, only after they wrote the mathematics of the spikes, we can very, very 
clearly say that we understand the spy. So let me summarize three highlights or three basic aspects of why to model mathematically. Because there are levels of why using mathematics. Okay, so let me say a few words about why modeling in general, mathematically, and in particular, why, why taking into account details. We'll discuss later the details, but I want to discuss the general notion of modeling or theory and also discuss the issue of details. So, so what, what are the, in general, three aspects of reasons for doing mathematical modeling of complex systems? The first thing, and the very clear thing, is that you want somehow to interpret your, your, your details, your experimental findings. So you find something experimental and you want to have some interpretation of these experiments. And not only interpretations, but you also want to have some predictions. So you take all that you have, like in the case of Hodgkin-Huxley for the squid axon, you take a lot of experimental results and you want to give this experiment some meaning, some interpretations, in order to cross from the details that you measured, from the microscopic details of, in case of Hodgkin-Huxley, the ions, the membranes, conductances, and so on, to the macroscopic phenomena of the spike. So you want to have this, the interpretation of how the details, how the experiments explain the phenomena. And not only that, what kind of predictions can you do using the model that you build. So the purpose of a good model is not only to replicate in a compact way the experiments, but also to provide some predictions. And indeed, Hodgkin-Huxley did predict the refractory period. They did predict, and we did not discuss it, the spike velocity within the axon. They predict aspects that were not directly put into the model. So interpretation and predictions are a very important part of a good model. The other part of the good model is the issue of finding key biophysical parameters. So the emphasis is on the word key. Because if you have the key parameters, not all the parameters, because there are, there are thousands of parameters that affect the phenomena. But there are key parameters, the major parameters, the key parameters, that if you have these parameters in your model, then your model behaves appropriately and you don't need more parameters in order to explain the gross phenomena, the spike, for example, like in the case of Hodgkin-Huxley model. So Hodgkin-Huxley found the key parameters that influence the spike. The membrane conductance for sodium and the membrane conductance for potassium and the kinetical parameters, the voltage-dependent parameters, N, M, and H, and so on. These are the key parameters. And they had the key parameters that are enough to describe the spike. So this enables them to compactly describe the phenomena because they have several key parameters and not all the parameters, so to speak. So the role of a good model is to compactly describe the phenomena and for this you need the key parameters. And the third level of a good model is that it enables you to cross, so to speak, to another level, level of description. In this case, you want to cross from the biophysical level of parameters to make the jump, conceptual jump, and to link, in the case of the brain, in the case of neuron, to link the biophysics into computation, into function. This is a big conceptual jump, like McCulloch and Pitts did, because McCulloch and Pitts took the synapses and took the spikes, the all or none property of a spike, and they did the conceptual jump and used these ingredients, the spike and the synapses, into a computational, logical computation in their case. So a good model enables you to think how this, so to speak, low level parameters, the spike, the synapses and conductances and, and so on, how, how can they be used for computation? This is the third important aspect of a good theory. Enables you to link level from biophysics to computations. And I want next to show you how does Roll, like McCulloch and Pitts, how, does, how did Roll take some of the biophysical parameters, in this case including dendrites, and using these notions, dendrites, synapses, and so on, in order to suggest computations that can be performed 
by the dendritic, by the extended dendritic tree. But before I'm going into the dendrites and to the theory of role, the cable theory of role for dendrites, before I'm going here, I want to show you uh, some thoughts about, of Ramon y Cajal about ereticians. So you already know well that I appreciate very much this great anatomist, Ramon y Cajal. I already mentioned him several times in my talks. And this time I want to show you uh, a set of phrases that he was using about theoreticians. He did not like theoreticians, like myself, then. And so this is what Ramon y Cajal wrote about theoreticians. So this is Ramon y Cajal that you already met. And Ramon y Cajal wrote a very nice little book, really nice little book. But in this book, I collected some of his antagonism to theory, to theorists like myself. Theorists are highly cultivated, wonderfully endowed minds, so this is good, whose wills suffer from a particular form of lethargy. They claim they view things in grand scale. They live in clouds. When forced with difficult problem, they feel the irresistible urge to formulate a theory rather than question the nature. The essential thing for them is the beauty of the concept. It matters very little to them if the concept is based on thin air. And finally, basically the theorist, like myself, is a lazy person masquerading as a diligent one. He unconsciously obeys the law of minimal effort because it is easier to fashion a theory than to discover a phenomena. This is well, beautifully written. We may agree with him or not. It's very hard to agree with him, of course, after the 1905 set of papers, by, theoretical papers by Einstein, who really made a huge jump. By the way, at the same years that uh, Ramon y Cajal functioned. So Ramon y Cajal didn't think much about theory, but I'm going to show you what is the impact of theory in understanding nerve cells.